All right, this, this feels very much like school, right? Where I might have to pick on individuals whose names I know to just shush, but <laughs> thanks. Good morning, everybody. If you are looking for the session, everyone's fair share of finding equitable, equitable taxation alternatives, you are in the right place. If that's not what you were looking for, stay anyway, because I'm sure you're going to find it intriguing. <laughs> my name is Elizabeth Ballerman. I am privileged to be the host for this session. Um, in my real life, I'm the president of the Health Sciences Association of Alberta and on the board of the Parkland Institute. Uh, we have two Cracker Jack presenters for you this morning who have made a life's work of looking at taxation and fairness and in income inequality and they've managed to point out that Alberta has had a leadership role in some uh, economic indicators, uh, particularly in uh, gender inequality and income inequality. Kathleen uh, Leahy, who will present first, uh, recently wrote with the Parkland Institute or through the Parkland Institute the Alberta Disadvantage, Gender Taxation and in Income Inequality. And as you can see in your, in your uh, programs, sorry? Did I not say Parkland? Did I, did I say broadband? Thank you, Ian. That was with Parkland. Okay, okay. Now it's time for me to wake up. My apologies. Uh, the Parkland Institute, of course, uh, the Alberta Disadvantage Gender Taxation and Income Inequality. And I remember it was some cold March day that we had a session here in Edmonton, but via Skype. And as you can see from your, from your program, she is really well qualified to do this. Uh, professor of Law at Queen's National, uh, Queen's National Scholar, Faculty of Law, Queen's University. And with their permission, I'm not going to read what is in front of you. You have, you have that. I'm presuming we're all literate, and uh, I, I don't want to steal too much of their time. Greg Flanagan, those of us who've been involved with the Parkland know him well. He used to be, I mean, he's been there pretty much since the beginning. He's written numerous articles relating to taxation and fairness and equality, etc. He served with me on the board some years ago, um, and he will talk uh, to you also about various tax measures. Uh, it will come as no surprise that he hasn't been a fan of the flat tax that until recently was Alberta. And one of his more in recent uh, uh, publications through the Parkland Institute or discussions was on income inequality, Alberta's income inequality being the worst in Canada. And of course we hope that M May 5th will help us to, re uh, to redirect that somewhat so we that we can stop being the leaders in those measures. So each of these speakers is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and uh, my job is to try to give them the hook if they get into too close. Um, I'll ask you to help me with that, because sometimes I get enmeshed in conversation and lose track, uh, but I'll try to do that. And then we will open up to your questions and answers. I think we've got the same setup as in the other rooms. We have some mic runners. Where are mic runners? Okay, they're Warren and? It's Warren. and. Keith? 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 Okay, all right. Uh, and when we get to there. So without further ado, Kathleen is going to lead us off uh, with her session, and then we will go over to Greg. So Kathleen, over to you. Hello. I'm just trying to figure out how to do this. Okay. Hi, my name is Kathleen Leahy, and I am really pleased to be here today. I feel when I come to Alberta and talk to people here about the issues that are of such great concern to all of us that I'm really talking to one of the most informed and committed groups of people in Canada, and, and properly so, because <clears throat> Alberta has always played an incredibly important role in the shaping of the national agenda for Canada as well as for the West. And in particular, women in Alberta have always played a key role in defining the kind of country that this is going to be, beginning with the very earliest people who began to concern themselves with the organization of this uh, colonial country. 
This is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. I may not be able to go into each of these points in as much depth as I would like. Greg and I were just talking about how, uh, given, given our way, we would each probably talk for 30, 40 hours. Um, <laughs> These, these are big and complex issues that go to the very nature of how human, how human beings organize themselves to live collaboratively and constructively together and to not remain locked in permanent sort of competition and warfare against each other. Uh, behaviors that we're seeing more and more of today and not surprisingly as the role of the state is continually bombarded from various directions by the demands of private capital, by the demands of groups that have ideologically driven agendas, and by groups that just simply don't want to share. Uh, the first point that I want to address is to talk about how we are actually standing at a transformational moment in the history of Canada for sure, but I think internationally as well. 2015 has turned out to be an incredibly transformative year, and I want to go through how in the context of international law and international developments, we are actually standing right at the center of what is unfolding around the globe as well as in Canada. The second point that I want to go through uh, from a sort of uh, uh, meso and uh, uh, micro level as well as the macro level is through the point of how the whole concept of taxing for growth, which has be, been a real sort of theme for the international community for decades now, really has, as our speaker last night so beautifully explained, left countries around the world with depleted treasuries and people not having their needs met by their governments. Uh, and I, I want to just go through the evidence that we can look to for the proposition that taxing for economic growth has not only depleted the federal Canadian and the Alberta treasuries, but has done the same sort of thing in country after country around the globe. And at the same time, international tax competition and international tax avoidance are running rampant and are hastening the depletion of these, these um, treasuries. The third point that I want to go through is how taxing for equality is part of a complete reframe uh, of the whole concept of the revenue production process because now in international law and in Canada, I think that it's really not possible to talk constructively about the role of tax policy without asking not only what kind of growth do we want, but also how are we going to take the biomass into account as we design our revenue systems? And how are we going to plan for economic and social development for the future? What are our social and cultural concerns? As well as, where does gender fit into all of the above? Short answer, everywhere, which is why it is uh, a major undertaking. And I'm going to conclude my talk by going through how taxing for gender equality means that we have to begin unwinding literally decades and centuries worth of social conventions that have become embedded in tax law and in the entire sort of uh, fiscal structure in Canada and in Alberta and sort of show you where the starting points are and invite you to move along in that direction as we hopefully get governments to take some leadership on these issues. So to the first point, uh, which is to sort of take a uh, larger view of just exactly what the whole point of taxation is and why we're looking at gender equality. For those of you who have been looking at gender equality issues over the last period of time. You've probably noticed that there is a significant shift in the various discourses around gender. 
beginning with some of the international financial organizations like the World Bank and beginning with various researchers, there is a growing recognition that actually gender equality is not a bad idea. And the, this began with the recognition that there's actually a so-called business case for gender equality. Now, I'm not here to promote that case, but it is worth recognizing that even the business management community has come to realize that if you're excluding half of the human race from decision making and policy formation processes, if you're excluding half of uh, the human race from the process of innovation and development and so on, you're just simply not going to get as many good ideas or as much energy coming to bear on issues as you would if you were involving everyone equally. And from this somewhat sort of narrow and pro-capitalist perspective on the uses of gender equality quickly followed a number of other recognitions, including the economic case for gender equality. Economies that are gender inclusive actually expand human capabilities and as more people become economically active, this grows tax bases and it enhances the quality in the process of social reproduction and it stabilizes economic growth. Then there is the well-being case. Researchers have discovered that gender equal societies are actually happier and healthier partly because women who are typically the most un un overworked people in a gender unequal society do a little bit better and the sharing of various human reproductive capacities it means that everyone improves in their overall well-being. The recession taught us that actually countries with higher levels of economic and gender equality have a more durable ability to carry through a period like a recession or other crises and recover more quickly from challenging economic conditions. And the most recent discovery is that when you reduce extreme inequalities, which is the um, policy buzzword for living under conditions of starvation, um, uh, and when you reduce poverty, you actually uh, can tackle that goal better by doing it on a gender equal basis. And so reducing the poverty of people who are impoverished by gender relations means that you actually have a uh, much more vital economy overall and everyone can participate more equally. So this is what the research literature tells us. And fortunately, the international human rights system has been sitting there waiting for people to wake up to these realities. And increasingly, International human rights laws are now being brought to bear on the demand that governments begin to tax people equally and that this equal taxation include gender equality. These slides will be available after this talk, so anyone who wants specific references should not worry. You'll have access to this kind of information, but I just quick, quickly want to pinpoint one of the most important international rules that come to bear on this whole subject matter, and that is the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, a UN convention which has, since it was ratified in the early 1980s, included economic and fiscal equality along with all other forms of gender equality and forms the basis for saying that when designing tax and transfer revenue and fiscal provisions, gender equality has to be at the heart of all of these policy decisions. Why? Because there are a number of specific guarantees in CEDAW that require equality of economic and social benefits, whether in the family unit or in the uh, larger sort of business context. Uh, women are entitled not only to equal property rights, but also to uh, the right to have all sex barriers to full participation in public life 
and barriers to paid work removed so that they can participate on equal terms along with men. This has been international law for several decades already, uh, and it has become understood that equal rights and equal terms include the right to expect that society will share all of the costs of social and economic reproduction equally on a gendered basis. This is a key text that almost no one ever reads, but I just want to flag it. In 1995, another really important and pivotal year in history, um, the uh, United Nations held the Fourth World Convention on Women's Rights in Beijing, China, and something called the Beijing Platform for Action was enacted. It is a document that contains 361 long, detailed paragraphs spelling out what countries' obligations are to implement gender equality in every aspect of the issues covered by the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And what I'm flagging here is some extracts from one of those very long paragraphs, paragraph 58, which is just one of many, but it's a good illustration. This spells out that as of 1995, Canada actually agreed, along with 180 other countries in the world, to do all of the things that you see on this slide. That is, to review all macroeconomic social policies from the point of view of securing the full and equal participation of women, which means that literally everything, every tax law, every pu public uh, um, revenue document, every loan program, everything of any economic or um, revenue significance that a country does has to be designed from the point of view of what does it do, not just generally, but what does it do to women in particular. And this is sort of at the heart of the basis for then moving into something that we can call taxing for gender equality. Why is 2015 such an important year? Well, because 2015 is the year in which the Millennium Development Goals expired many of which were unmet, and in the lead up to adopting the Sustainable Development Goals, which were approved by the United Nations just this fall, the Sustainable Development Goals took a much broader view of what it would take to achieve the development and equality aspirations that have been accepted as driving international law. And so the new UN Sustainable Development Goals have at their heart in SDG goal number five, the elimination of gender inequalities as a standalone goal and as a component of all of the other 16 goals. At the same time, another really important but very, well, very sort of misunderstood process unfolded, the United Nations Financing for Development process, which culminated in meetings held in Addis Ababa earlier this year, resulted in literally adopting through an express standalone resolution all of the things that you just saw in slide, the slide outlining paragraph 58 of the Beijing Platform for Action. So financing for development now means that all financial institutions, such as the World Bank, the IMF, and so on, all countries, all provinces, all municipalities, and all non-governmental organizations, including the Parkland Institute, are now obligated to follow all of these gender-inclusive uh, principles in formulating their policies going forward. Uh, at the same time, there was a 20-year review of how the Beijing Platform for Action has been implemented. Canada came out very badly in that review and got a lot of criticism from the UN. Uh, the bottom line here is that the international community is now poised to move much more aggressively ahead with the agenda that I'm here to talk to you about today. In addition, in the lead up to 2015, the new optional protocol to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women 
began to produce important decisions that have legal force in international law. Block in the Netherlands involved discrimination alleged by a woman in relation to changes to maternity benefits in the Netherlands. She filed a complaint, and in this decision, for the first time, the committee that heard this complaint ruled that even if a country did not pass domesticating legislation that says what that treaty says is law in this country, essentially, it's still binding. Why? Because that country signed the treaty. And it went on to order that the country pay damages to the woman to compensate her for the discrimination. I say that Canada is playing an important role in all of this because earlier this year, interestingly, on International Women's Day, the same committee filed another even more ground-shaking decision called the Inquiry Report Concerning Canada. Fascinating name, right? And in this inquiry report, which was filed on behalf of Indigenous women in Canada, the committee concluded that Canada had been so in breach of its obligations to Indigenous women and to Aboriginal peoples generally in Canada that it issued five solid pages of detailed recommendations requiring Canada and all of its subnational units to take many, many different steps to eliminate this form of ongoing colonialism and discrimination. This slide continues with some of the specific recommendations, including uh, develop all sorts of anti-poverty, food security, housing, education, and employment strategies designed to eliminate the permanent structural socioeconomic state of deprivation in which Aboriginal peoples live in Canada. So the world scene has changed. The world is looking at Canada going, what happened in Canada that it has come to this? And the world has also confirmed that equality means parity. 50% women in most countries, 50% of whatever is going on. This brings me to the second point, taxing for economic growth. I'll go through this much more quickly. And uh, b my basic point here is that the mentality of structuring everything around going for growth in contemporary politics has led to the production of literally a formula that is designed to achieve maximum economic growth. And you'll recognize all of these elements in this formula. It starts with reduce corporate and personal income tax rates. Cut those top rates. Make those rich people feel that they can make money wherever they are without having to pay too much in the way of taxes, either through their corporations or through their own personal tax returns. Secondly, increase local taxes. What are those? They're taxes on property, sales taxes, and environmental taxes like carbon taxes. Why increase those? Because those are paid by the people who are not rich enough to be able to just up and skip out of the country if they don't like the tax system. These are the people who cannot just ship their money off to some offshore tax haven or use a complex tax transfer arrangement to move into, for example, uh, a, um, a tax haven through a corporate inversion and shelter their tax in a low tax haven. In other words, increase these flat-rated taxes on the people who can't go anywhere to avoid them and use a lot of flat-rated taxes because those flat-rated taxes never discriminate on the basis of income and they will tax even the poorest no matter where they are and how much they have. The third piece in this formula is declare that capital and corporate sectors have no responsibility for retirement, disability, unemployment, illness, maternity leave, etc. Fourthly, eliminate subsidies for housing. People should be responsible for themselves is part of this formula. 
And to the extent that the tax system does hand out benefits, this taxing for growth formula, this is in all of the publications of the Organization for Economic Co and Cooperation and Development, the OECD. It's conditionalities set up by the IMF to make bailout loans to countries like Greece. It is conditionalities attached to uh, programs set up by the World Bank, et cetera. The next piece says only use your tax system to help business, subsidize business, subsidize innovation, reward economic growth, and set up special export zones, which sometimes contain not only zero taxes, but that actually uh, provide subsidies. Eliminate sector and trade subsidies and barriers. That is, liberate free trade as if it's not already free enough. Uh, and the very last point, and this is an important one, I've put it in bold, increase married women's involvement in paid work. Why? Because countries that use married women as paid work under the conditions that we have created in country after country means that they're actually a low, low price source of labor. They're a source of cheap labor because they have virtually no protections. Why? Because the assumption is that if they can't support themselves on what they earn, that's okay. They're in relationships. Their spouse can support them because men always make more money than women. So trading in married women's paid work is part of this formula. Now, where has this taken us? This is just a quick little sort of trip through tax cut uh, um, hell, I guess you could call it. Um, this is the way taxes looked back in the 1960s, 1970s, when countries were still beginning to recognize their obligations to the people who live in their borders. And what you see here is the lo longer the horizontal bars, the larger the expansion of the tax system in the country. The red arrow, that's Canada. Canada was an international leader in growing its tax base to meet the needs of the population. The green arrow is the United Kingdom. It wasn't right up there with Canada, but it was up there pretty high. The United, United Kingdom is important here, so just watch where the arrows go. As time has passed, the emphasis has shifted not to growing tax bases, but to cutting them. Whose idea was this? Well, we can get a hint from where that green arrow has gone. That's England, and that is the Thatcher years. See the dramatic cut that took place in the English context. Canada, however, held firm with continued expansion of its tax bases. This takes us up to 19, the expansion that had taken place by 1995. Now we're looking at what has happened uh, over the period of time leading up to 2009. Canada has become the world leader in tax cutting, outdistanced only by the Slovak Republic and Ireland, two countries which uh, cut their taxes even more fully. But look where the UK went. It had already figured out that it had made a mistake. It was back up there with a much more intact tax transfer system because it had begun to expand its taxes again. And here is as close as I could get to where we are now. Canada is still a world leader in tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. And the UK is sitting there smugly on a fairly hefty tax base in comparison to Canada, all the while still being held out, the UK, as the paradigm for the going for growth or tax cutting for growth mentality that has gripped the world. Um, this is what is held out as a record of excellence. Now, how is this played out in the Canadian context? And I will sort of um, scoot ahead to a couple of other um, Slides, oh, actually, no, I'll go back, sorry. Um, I just go through what this means from the point of view of here and now. Uh, one of the things that I've spent some time doing in the last couple of months is to go into what I call the sort of way back machine in terms of uh, tax transfer micro simulation analysis. 
and uh, through the process of recoding the 2016 tax transfer systems in Canada as if it were still 1997, we were able to calculate that in the year 2016, if the tax systems that had been in existence in Canada in basically 1995 through 1997 were still in place, in 2016, Canada and all the provincial governments would have had, or no, this is just Canada federally, would have had $94 billion more revenue coming in than they will have in 2016. That is, the federal government is $94 billion poorer next year because of the cumulative effect of all of these tax cuts. And what this means is that every year between then, 1995, 1997, and now, the constant tax cuts have cut more and more billions and billions of dollars out of annual revenues every year. This is what starving a country of revenue looks like. And these cuts have been significant. They've come from the personal income tax cuts, corporate, and GST. Alberta has done the same thing on the Alberta scale. Beginning in, this is another way back machine calculation that was done for purposes of the Parkland report. Uh, if Alberta in 2009, that was the furthest year we could go forward on that particular program, uh, if in 2009 Alberta had never gone to its flat tax system, which it did at the end of the 1990s, in 2009, it would have had $4.6 billion more in revenue than it did in that year. And every year since 2009, it would have had at least that much, if not a little bit more. Uh, and in this year, 2015, it would have had something like $6 billion more revenue every year. This is how this kind of pervasive tax cutting works. Now, I'll just make one further point in relation to the overall sort of manipulation of the whole tax transfer system, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, and you'll see the bars here called OECD. The dark purple or the red bar here is tallest for the OECD because the richest countries in the world still collect more of their revenue from progressive tax rates corporate tax rates and personal income tax rates than they do from the flat rated taxes. But you can see what happens when this flat tax mentality gets a grip on countries. Most of the other countries in the world actually have much harder, higher levels of revenue produced by flat taxes than they do by progressive taxes. Why? Because their tax systems were designed with the help of the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, and other organizations like that. In Alberta, this is an example of how this flat taxing has played out here. What you see with the bars going down, that's all the money saved for people with high incomes by having a flat tax that just cuts off, cuts out all of that progressivity. And the bars that are pointing upward, that's the new taxes being paid by the people with the lowest and the moderate incomes. This is how the tax burden of the well-off in Alberta has been put on the shoulders of people with no or low or moderate incomes for decades now. And this is the end of my time a perfect uh, sort of second to last slide here. This shows historically the relationship between tax rates and the concentration of wealth in Canada. And I will just click over to this. Um, as we go into the discussion, I can elaborate on how since 1995, when Canada was not only the highest rated country in terms of human development and also uh, gender equality, as Canada began cutting its taxes, uh, it began to fall and has continued to fall in the equality ratings with the result that, uh, led by women in Alberta, the levels of gender equality in Canada uh, continue to go down as the tax system fails to support any kind of sustainable human development.
Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. One, one always hates to cut off when, when there's such in, information dense stuff happening, but uh, Greg will add to this now. And uh, who can help Greg make sure that he can get to his tech support? That is not my skill set. Good morning, and uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, well, we're going to generate a little bit of controversy because, uh, and this is your warning, like there will be coarse language. Uh, yep. I uh, actually am a supporter, advocate for the sales tax, the general sales tax in Alberta at this time, although I do have, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no exits, <laughs> good. Um, I do have a, a fairly academic kind of approach to taxes uh, that would do all the things that people have been calling for, simplify it, uh, make it extremely progressive. I could reduce, oh, I don't know, about a stack of telephone books, for those of you who remember what a telephone book looks like, of the tax code down to a postcard. But I don't think anybody's going to go for that anytime soon. But anyway. Uh, the tax system's broken, that's what's broken, and uh, it's been broken in Alberta a long time with, uh, with Klein's government uh, starting in 93. Uh, probably, maybe a little more significantly, it's been broken by Harper now at the federal level. And, you know, Justin Trudeau got in recently, he seems to be moving fast on his promises, and it looks very good on a number of things, but they're kind of small potatoes compared to the broken tax system, which of course they've just discovered uh, has a $6 billion shortfall from what uh, our previous Prime Minister stated in the election. And that's the consequence of the broken tax system. And there's nothing in the platform, uh, in the proposals, to, to correct that. So our federal government is handicapped severely. A good article on that in the uh, Ottawa Citizen yesterday on how that's handicapping the, the federal system. I'll give you an example uh, that's coming down the pike. My first analogy was the Titanic hitting an iceberg, but I think I want to change that and say that the growing iceberg is going to hit Good Ship Canada, and that growing iceberg is the TFSA, or the tax-free savings account, because the next generation who are being promoted, and I support that, to have a nest egg in their retirement will be paying no taxes if they manage that appropriately. And I don't think we can afford to have that contingent of society paying no taxes at all on income generated. And that's certainly been part of the setup of destroying the tax system uh, in, in the federal level. I also think, uh, whether people like it or not, there, the financial incentives do change behavior, and behavioral changes are very important in our tax system and have to be considered. Uh, so I'll talk to that too. So anyway, I, I want to explore how we might solve this problem and still bring some uh, progressivity uh, into the system. Uh, Kathleen has outlined, you know, the movement to a flatter tax base in all taxes, and certainly that is as not a good thing. And there's a, I've got a study I'll refer to uh, in a moment. Uh, context, list of tax types, I'll go fairly quickly with these. The issues uh, as I see it, and then we'll look at personal income tax, commodity taxes, and my recommendations. <clears throat> this this uh, talk is from a Parkland study I did in 2011. Uh, I think it's maybe more, uh, it may be more uh, useful in the new, in the context of the new government. So, uh, it's definitely about bringing revenue in, which of course the uh, conservative government in Alberta was, that's the first step in a, in a neoconservative program is cut the finances so you can say we don't have any money and we have to cut everything else. Uh, <clears throat> I've got the tax fact book here because it's, a, it's 177 pages, but it's an excellent source of all the kind of details in the tax system in Canada and each province. It's brought to you by uh, KMPG, who have allegedly uh, created fictitious offshore companies so that the very wealthy don't have to pay any tax. Uh, so 
<laughs> they certainly know their tax systems, but not putting it necessarily to any good. But it is a good source of the tax facts and easily accessible on the, on the internet just by, by Googling them. Um, just in the context, I'm taking resource rents out to analyze this, taking out the royalty system. And, um, you know, I do that kind of academically, but I honestly believe they shouldn't be part of the current budget. Uh, staggered over years, possibly used for other, you know, capital things, extra capital adventures or whatever, the income, sure. But I think this is the fundamental problem Alberta's had, uh, relying on resource rents in current budgets and then cutting the budgets when the royalties are down and then having to build the system back up. It's been extremely destructive to the public service. I, I uh, think it's great the new government at least broke that by saying we're not going to just jump on the fact that the price of oil's down and start cutting the budget. So that's a first step. Uh, <clears throat> there is a review though, and I think uh, as much as people can participate, I highly recommend uh, Alan McFadden's book, uh, Petro, Petroleum Petro Products, uh, sorry, Petro Politics. Is it spelled right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's actually a free ebook from the University of Calgary. They encourage you to pay for it if you're going to use the whole thing or, or to support the endeavor. But anyone can get that book. It is, uh, you know, it's pretty thick itself. I recommend Chapter 11 because it goes through the huge and tremendous complexity of the royalty system uh, as it's been and where it's uh, been weak and so on. But I'm going to skip it. So those two things are out of the, out of the question in this paper. Um, tax possibilities, you kind of know this list. There's the income taxes, corporate personal income, uh, commodity taxes, a whole slew there. All that list of commodity taxes is uh, by, by uh, structure, by looking at it from a, from a mathematical point, are considerably regressive. The income tax, even in Alberta, uh, weekly was progressive by the definition of progressivity, which is that the average tax paid goes up with income. And it had some progressivity because there was a zero rate as well as the 10% rate. And it was quite an extensive bracket, you know, it's $16,000, $17,000, up to 18000 I think, this year. Uh, these commodity taxes, uh, many are, are invoked to change behavior. They are the ones change behavior. So a, a tobacco tax is meant to curtail the use of tobacco. Uh, it's not so great for those addicted, they just pay more, and usually that's very regressive. But they do work for particularly youth, uh, d dissuading them from getting into it. Same with liquor taxes. I've done a major study on liquor, and the interesting thing with Alberta, again, is they, they made the liquor tax flat, whereas it used to be considerably progressive, um, uh, it correlated with income. Uh, gasoline taxes change your behavior, presumably moving away from the use of gasoline. Uh, land transfer taxes, property taxes, highly regressive. Carbon tax has been pointed out by Kathleen, regressive. But necessary, <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. Uh, we need a carbon tax, because it does change behavior. It moves people away from carbon. Um, now, all of those taxes can be alleviated in terms of their regressivity by giving people back the money. And BC's not done a bad job on that with the carbon tax. Uh, so there's rebates to low-income people. There's lower tax brackets in the, in the personal income tax range in order to not make that revenue neutral, as they say, and get the money back. So the objective of the tax is not to build revenue. It's to change behavior and it's uh, somewhat effective. It has a little bit of a, a, another advantage in that gasoline in BC hasn't gone down that much, even with the uh, lower price of oil. Because actually the cost of the oil in the price of gasoline isn't that much, once you take the federal and provincial taxes, the carbon tax, and so on. So, so you know, the gas price is still up there, and it is, uh, you know, doing its, uh, its job. 
The general sales tax is the most controversial. And again, there are many ways to offset its natural regressivity. And uh, we have those in place with the GST. First of all, there's things that you don't put it, you don't come under the tax. So food and shelter and so on, so that everybody has that untaxed. Uh, there are rebate systems for people depending on their income, so it becomes a transfer system. Uh, it is still regressive in that it's going to be a lower percentage for, of someone's income, the higher income you are. But again, in BC, if you buy a BMW for $100,000, the provincial sales tax is 10%. That's $10,000. I don't have a problem with that for people buying BMWs, and they don't either because the sales are doing very well. Um, a 30,000 Hyundai would be at 7% or $2,100. So, so there's, a, there's an offsetting factor in having a variable rate in the GST on the big items where it can be administered. Uh, payroll taxes, as they're called, but usually they're funding something that's a payback, and it's again, uh, you know, you have certain amounts go to a certain, uh, a certain um, income, and therefore they're going to be regressive. So they are all regressive in their tendencies, but there's ways to offset them. So the issues, we want to build something that's fair and equitable, i.e. progressive. Uh, we want to be very much aware of the behavioral responses, and that includes in the income tax, because there's a lot of assumptions made. We do, as always, want to be efficient in, in how we administer, employ, design a tax system. Uh, we also keep, have to keep it in mind, you know, I've got some serious criticisms or disappointments in the, in the first budget of the new government, uh, <clears throat> but I don't have a problem with the deficit giving the kind of... Uh, broad macroeconomic situation in Alberta. Running a deficit here is not a bad idea for now, but I think we still have to fix the revenue system long term so that uh, we can utilize the, the cycle of business effectively by having surpluses and deficits and so on and fund it accordingly. <clears throat> uh, this table is going to be very hard to read there and the reason I have it is um, it shows a number of things. You can see the different rates, and you can look this up, and it's out of the uh, KMPG book. Um, the red numbers are where the new rates have been introduced. Alberta has gone from 10% across the board. Uh, BC added at 16.8% at the top level, at 151,000 up. Uh, Nova Scotia added three higher rates. Uh, Newfoundland added a couple higher rates. And if you look at the numbers where these things kick in, for example, 12% kicks in in Alberta at 125,000, but 12.5% kicks in in Manitoba at 31,000. So you can, you know, improve the progressivity, but the fact remains you still got to make it generate some revenue. Uh, so you can get a sense of where Alberta is in that. Um, this shows the personal income, the latest 2013, when I wrote the paper, the 2010. A couple things there. Incomes have moved up. The number of people with higher incomes has moved up. Uh, but if you'll note where the 12% kicks in, the bar isn't too high. And then, of course, small bars, these are numbers of people in those income ranges. So I have estimated, using my numbers, what the tax overall would generate, and I'm pretty much dead on with the, uh, the current budget at $12 billion from, from personal income tax. Uh, Minister Sisi has predicted about 330, maybe 450 million uh, from the, the new progressive increases. Uh, my numbers are actually giving me about 240, 280 millions. So that's good. But it's, you know, a tiny fraction of the budget problem, and so it's really not addressing, using this income tax is not addressing the, the issue. Um, here's just a graph of the, I'm going to come to why I'm using these things, but here is a simple graph of Alberta under the 10% regime. And you see the, the, the movement from 0 to 10, and, and then straight across. 
and the red line is the average tax function that that generates, and you can see that it is progressive, weekly so, but it is progressive, that is, average tax goes up uh, with incomes. So, you know, uh, income taxes will have that, even in the worst case here, will have that tendency. This is the new, under the 2015 reforms, and so it rises to a higher rate, of course, to approaching, approach 15% way out there, and, uh, and it steps you up there. Uh, so these, uh, these functions, what I've been playing around with in the last while is trying to work out an index. You hear index numbers used all the time to give you a feel for something, and I'm looking for one that indexes progressivity. So I've got all the tax functions in Canada, and I've run these functions. That gives you an idea. The R squared is 0.97, so it's a very good fit. And then I get an equation that's got two parameters, as we call it, in mathematics. And that's where I'm leading up to creating a postcard tax function where we would have a tax. Your tax is equal A times your income to the B. And very simple plug it in, you know what the tax should be paid. Y should be your income. That is, I go with the Carter Commission way back in the 60s, a buck is a buck is a buck. So, and, and I'll come back to that about behavioral changes and the assumptions about how that uh, 330 or 240 uh, million extra monies are gonna come in. <clears throat> this chart then shows the coefficients. I'm gonna use those coefficients. So if you look at the third column, with the coefficients, they're ranked according to the coefficient in Alberta uh, is number one, that is it has the least progressive from my coefficient, Quebec was the most progressive, and, and so on down the line. You can see that Alberta moved under the new tax regime, huge, so that's really positive. It's down uh, into sixth or seventh place there with, the, with that uh, change. So putting in the extra brackets did did improve the progressivity of the personal income tax. <clears throat> so we've talked about these at greater length earlier. So, and we've talked about them being, uh, being regressive in general, uh, changing behavior. Now the key thing here is that if I go back here, the expectation of these 12, 13, 14% on those income is assuming there won't be behavioral changes with those new indexes. And so my estimate, uh, Minister Sisi's estimate, is certainly on the outside of what those would be because people in those incomes can react to those new tax things. They can shift their income into means that are lower taxed. For example, capital gains are taxed at half the rate so if you take your income in capital gains and you're in the 15% range, you're actually only going to be paying 7.5%. And that's below the 10% that somebody in the $20,000 range is paying. So, you know, you have to watch for these things and build a system. When we look at progressivity, I would like to look at the whole taxation system, and I'm always enamored by this study in 1995 by Vermeiden's. And we need to do that. I really think we need a tax commission in Alberta, more generally Canada. Many countries have been doing this. And I like this style where instead of looking at these abstract charts of what might happen, estimating what might happen when you put the rates up, let's start looking about the actual tax paid. That's what they did. They surveyed people in what they paid at certain incomes and found that generally people were paying just 38 to 40% range in 1995. At that time, uh, the, the um, federal uh, income tax was much more progressive. We had progressive provincial income taxes. We had fewer commodity taxes. And even in the end, the tax was pretty flat what people paid. This includes what you paid on property, whether you're a renter or not, what you paid in, in sales taxes, what you paid in whatever tax you pay. Uh, so it's pretty flat in general. Now, I, this is probably worse now, but we need to design a tax system 
where the overall tax effect is progressive. And I believe that's achievable. We first have to know what it is, and we have to have some sort of indicators, indexes, to tell us when we've improved it, like I've done with the personal income tax. So, <clears throat> recommendations. Institute a tax review. Adjust the personal income tax at the first stage here in Alberta to generate more revenue. That means moving those brackets back. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I think Alex was pointing this out last night. We got to pay more taxes, and that means everybody. It just, you know, we want it progressive, but we got to pay more. Uh, I'm, I'm very disappointed in a couple things um, that the current budget still has the rhetorical stuff about Alberta's tax advantage. We should not be doing that. Uh, it's not an advantage. It's curtailing the possibilities we heard about last night. So we need to get off that. Uh, the other disappointment is that, the, you know, the, the Premier said that there would never be a sales tax on our watch. And I, and I think that may or may not be the case, but it should have been looked at seriously in whatever form before just flatly stating that. So anyway, I, I do say under the current system, we've got to implement uh, a general sales tax, certainly harmonize it. Five, I get, my estimates are about a, a billion bucks per percentage. I think a 5% sales tax would, would be reasonable, again, with all of the offsetting measures to improve its progressivity. And of course, I want to see a carbon tax. I think that's really badly needed to, again, change behavior away from carbon use. And I don't mean carbon tax just to the producers, I mean to the consumers. And then I want to see the whole system done as a system and integrate the tax transfer system, and I'd like to see guaranteed income. And uh, <clears throat> my graphs where I've done the average tax, and that function, that simple function I've talked about, would have a, an inherent subsidy below zero income. You would get income. But you would be... You, the incentive to work or earn income to the ability you could would still always be there. You'll just pay the given tax rate on the incremental income as you earn. So there's no, no lost incentive in terms of getting, you know, a check from the government. So anyway, I'll leave you to the paper because it goes on to my, my lovely simple tax function, which didn't go very far. But uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so in just looking at uh, the two presenters, the one area that they might actually disagree at fairly fundamentally is this whole question of a sales tax. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm not sure that Kathleen wants to actually address that because she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what the answer to that is. Hi, and I'm going to see if I can just, can you flip me back to my deck? Um, because uh, it always sounds good to say, yes, let's just have a sales tax and um, scoop up massive amounts, thank you, uh, of revenue and uh, sort of equip ourselves with enough revenue to solve all of everyone's problems. Except the problem is that when we don't uh, pay attention to gender, and when we don't pay attention to who pays sales taxes, we end up doing what we thought we were going to stop doing, which is overtaxing low-income people and overtaxing women and undertaxing people with high incomes. This is uh, a table that's out of the Parkland report that I prepared. It doesn't break it down by gender, but it shows that in a jurisdiction like Alberta, where, remember, the minimum personal income tax rate is still 10%. When the government added a couple of higher rates, it did not lower that low rate. In Ontario, the lowest income tax rate for low-income people is 5%, not 10%. So people in Alberta with incomes under the first uh, uh, cutoff are still paying practically twice as much personal income tax as they ought to. Okay, and now you want to come along and you want to put 
a sales tax, you want to put a carbon tax, you want to put some sort of a consumption tax on there for a quick fix. Governments have to stop getting quick fixes from the people who have to eat. and from the people who have to buy a few clothes for their kids, and so on. Now, there is a simple solution, and that is get over the Alberta tax advantage, right? Lower those low-income tax rates, raise those high-income tax rates, personal income tax rates further to further offset the benefit of lowering the low-income tax rate will have on people with low incomes, and then keep holding off on these flat-rated taxes. You don't need those. The second quick point is that carbon taxes don't have to be at the retail level. They can be at the manufacturing level, and it's much more equitable, but we could have that conversation another time. And the third point is these refundable tax credits for the GST, et cetera, they don't begin to make up for the regressivity of the GST itself. Okay. I'm going to give Greg the microphone for a moment if he wants to rebut that. Uh, my runners, where are the people with questions? One, one right behind you there. Oh, oh, batteries, yes. Okay, Greg will end. Do you want to respond to that at all, Greg? Of course he does. Well, I don't really need to. I understand fully, you know, the, the hesitation with, with the taxes. But, you know, the, the very wealthy can move their tax systems quite easily on income as well as, you know, when Kathleen says, well, you're taxing the people who can't move. But if they want to live in the community, they, they buy things and that's where you're going to get the money. This latest increase to the very, very wealthiest in Alberta still isn't going to cost them as much as a sales tax on the car that they just bought last week. So, I, I, you know, if we can push the the if we can push the income tax without adjustment, you know, you assume that people aren't going to react to that. Without behavioral changes, then sure, let's push it up, um, and then you solve that problem. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do, you know, I'm I'm pushing in the current environment a sales tax as a reasonable out of a revenue problem, but that's not what I really want to see. I want to see my nice function where every dollar you earn extra will be taxed slightly more, very marginally more. Uh, every dollar, not jumping into tax brackets. Uh, and, and you can make that a consumption tax if you like, but it'll be a hugely It is not something that is charged on savings, and the only the top 15 highest income earners have enough income to be able to save any money. So one of the really big reasons that you don't want to go into any kind of a consumption tax is that you're automatically letting the highest income earners off of what would otherwise, as a personal income tax, be taxable. So. That, that is like, it, it works the same as a TSFA, a tax-free savings account. If you have a consumption tax, sure, they'll pay more on BMWs, but they won't pay anything on the millions and billions that are being socked away in investment accounts. 
I think we've started a bit of a debate here. Um, how are we doing on the microphone for the audience? Not? Okay. Oh, that, that one's working? Okay. Um, uh, I just want you to note the difference between a, a exempting savings and a TFSA. A TFSA does not exempt that savings. You pay tax on that money putting in. You don't pay tax on the income forever thereafter. So if you put all your lifetime savings in a TFSA, which in 30 years, people starting now will have that, you won't pay any tax on income because you won't have any income. They don't count income in a TFSA. So I just want to make that point. Okay, we're back to the, this mic has to be off when that one is on. So. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, I had a knee-jerk reaction in supporting the idea of an income tax because I'm very frustrated about uh, how the Alberta government has managed to effectively steal from future generations by um, allowing the current population a much lower tax rate that would then disallow future investments in the Heritage Fund, and we've lost such a huge opportunity in that exercise of self-aggrandizement in the consumer culture. But uh, I'd like to also uh, ask whether either of you have got anything concrete in the way of numbers to support the idea of progressive income tax solutions versus just a revenue strategy of addressing it with a sales tax, which is obviously regressive. So I, I was just wondering whether you've got anything in the way of percentages or, or, or numbers that you could toss out to us is it, okay. about those choices, those tax choices. So just asking, I saw a fair bit about progressive income taxes in the presentations, but uh, I'll ask our presenters to respond if there's anything further you'd like to add. Yeah, I can add, um, I don't have any figures with me that I can easily give you, but countries that have gone heavily into GST or value-added type taxes to make up those big revenue cuts, countries like Sweden are often trotted out as an example of why we should do this. Well, I spent several months living and working and studying in Sweden to find out exactly what is going on, and I came away realizing that it was enacted in order to compensate for two things. Number one, massive cuts to the corporate income tax rates that are imposed on the big companies like Ikea and Volvo to help them remain internationally competitive. And secondly, it was done in order to make up for the light taxation on capital by rich people who live and work in Sweden. So what happened was that the personal income tax rates were were increased and made very, very high for human beings and the consumption taxes, the VAT, was increased at the same time because they had to get the revenue from someplace. And it's very regressive and it means that people literally don't have enough money to make ends meet now that the Swedish uh, social welfare network is being scaled back under the uh, guidance of its new conservative government. So when you leave a population at the mercy of high consumption taxes or sales taxes that for revenue, what you're doing is you're leaving that population at the mercy of future sort of tax whims. And it's a lesson that people in Europe are starting to learn, I think, rather late. Well, I did do estimates of uh, trying to get the personal income tax system uh, to generate more revenue and, and be very progressive. Uh, it just takes, you, you can't do what was done, just tack them on to that, those small numbers at the end of the income stream. You really have to move it down. Uh, you know, the, the exempt amount in Alberta, 18,000 this year, is you know, close to 10,000 more than any other province. Um, I mean, that's a huge shift in terms of where the money is. I mean, the, the money, if you look at the income chart there, you've got to tax that. Now you can do it with income tax. One of the reasons for a broader base of different taxes is that they, they overlap. The, you, you can't capture 
you can't capture everybody under one system, so you have these other systems. And, you know, our, I'm, I'm all for a simple progressive tax system. What Harper also did to our federal tax is he brought in, you know, if you take the bus on Tuesdays uh, and you're over 18 and you're under 50, you get a tax break. You know, or if you play soccer, you get a tax break, but if you go play the violin, you don't. Uh, and it just is a mess. And so people respond to those things, though, and they reduce their taxes. And there's all kinds of, we just got a host, a host of, of ways to get out of income tax. The fact of the matter is, with a consumption tax at the till, you pay it. You got to pay it. It's really hard to get out of. And, as I say, there are means to compensate and make that in effect, that's my general index I want to want to develop. Make sure that the system is generating that progressivity. It doesn't matter where you get the dollar, as long as the system is progressive. Make the system work. I think part of what Kathleen's saying is the current system doesn't work. But that's not a that's not an argument against having a broad base of different taxes. Make the broad base system work, and be progressive. Uh, and people respond to taxes in, in different ways, and different taxes in different ways. And, they, and behavior, as I say, is a factor here. So you get them kind of in different ways. If you just boost the income tax to pay, you know, this deficit you're talking about, it's going to be huge. To get $6 billion out of that is going to be huge. Uh, Minister CC got, you know, $300 million. That's if there isn't an adjustment in the way people do their taxes. Thank you. Okay, we are running very close to lunchtime, and uh, I know we could carry this on and over the weekend will for, for um, the, all the various sessions. So I, I apologize that we haven't got time for more questions. Uh, before you go, please make sure you fill out your evaluation forms and leave them at the Parkland desk. Lunch is in the basement behind where we were, and I'd like you just to join me in thanking our presenters one more time for this presentation. Thank you. And we have a small, small gift.